Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar, Why Are Food Manufacturers Switching to Non-GMO Sunflower Oil, which is being presented by the National Sunflower Association. I'm Chris Gould, and I work on the promotion of sunflower oil in Canada. Today, we have two excellent speakers who will take us through the webinar. And if you think of any questions as we go along, please type your question into the chat box, which you should be able to see in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Our presenters will answer your questions at the end of the webinar. We will be recording the webinar in the event that you would like to share it with other members of your team. It will be posted on the National Sunflower Association website uh, later this week. I'd now like to take the opportunity to introduce our two presenters, John Sandbachen and Michelle Peitz. Some of you may have met John on his visits to Canada. John is currently the Executive Director of the National Sunflower Association, which is based in Mandan, North Dakota. John has been with the NSA for many years, and in addition to his duties as Executive Director, he oversees the international market development, education, and research for both U.S. sunflower oil and confectionery products. Michelle Peitz is a technical sales rep in the oils division at ADM. She has a food science degree from Iowa State University and is an active member in the American Oil Chemist Society. Michelle is an expert in oil functionality and is actively involved in providing customer support on a variety of food applications. I'm now going to turn the webinar over to John, who will take us through the first part of the presentation. Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope you're having a, a great afternoon, I guess, in some parts of the country and morning in others. I uh, just want to just kind of walk through the overview of our webinar today. Uh, first, to just talk a little bit about who the National Sunflower Association is, uh, talk about the Health Canada update, um, some Canadian perceptions of sunflower oil, trends to watch, uh, we'll get into the attributes of sunflower oil, the types of sunflower oil, a fatty acid comp comparison of selected oils, uh, we'll talk a little bit about OSI profile of various oils, some research studies and applications, the health benefits of sunflower oil, and the future of sunflower oil. Just, just to give you a little bit of background on the National Sunflower Association, as, as Chris had mentioned, we are based in North Dakota. Uh, NSA is a nonprofit organization that consists of both not only the farmers that grow the seeds that are crushed into oil, but also the processors and the exporters of the oil to your market. Uh, NSA is focused mainly on market development, education, production, and also on utilization research. And um, some of you probably will know this, but Canada is our number one export market for refined U.S. sunflower oil. Um, our crushing plants and refineries are very close to the Canadian border, so we we're in an optimal position to deliver oil, and thus Canada is our number one export market. Uh, this year, uh, sunflower growers have harvested approximately about 1.4 million acres of oil-type sunflowers, and our production estimate right now as of 2016 forecast is estimated at about 2.45 billion pounds. Um, looking ahead to next year, um, just some of the early indications we're getting is that acreage is going to expect it to increase by about 8 to 10 percent given the current demand scenario that we have. Uh, in, in some of you are probably aware of this. We, we've touched on this. I know some of our messages and other things about Health Canada. Uh, it acknowledges the role of healthy fats in the diet. The food guide recommends that Canadians consume two to three tablespoons of unsaturated fats or oils such as sunflower oil each day. Uh, many of you remember in 2012, Health Canada approved a new health claim advising consumers to replace dietary sources of saturated fat with polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats from vegetable oil in order to lower cholesterol. Um, just recently in October of this year, Health Canada announced some revisions to Canada's healthy eating guidelines, including new rules for marketing and labeling of certain foods aimed at children. Uh, the new regulations will eventually require front of package labeling that highlights if a product is high or low in certain nutrients, including saturated fats. So 
so what are some of the Canadian perceptions of sunflower oil? Um, NSA has invested in various omnibus studies and, and just various research projects, and we found that 84% of Canadians believe sunflower oil is a healthy oil, 71% believe that sun, sun oil is healthier than most other oils, and even 73% believe it's healthier than canola. 64% of Canadians indicate that they are interested in purchasing products made with sunflower oil, which is a very positive trend. And 93% of Canadian chefs believe that sunflower oil is a good choice for deep frying. And so what are some of the macro food trends that, that we're hearing about or we're reading about for 2017, things that are very on the front minds of, of people that are consuming oil or using oil in their products? Clean label um, is very, very much a big issue right now, having a clean label and evolving that into a clean supply chain. Uh, Plant-based and vegan offerings are also front of mind. Health and wellness, whether that be as far as organic, non-GMO, free from, or probiotics. And sunflower oil is, all sunflower oil from the United States is a non-GMO product, so we fit in very nicely with this trend. Ancient grains are also something top of mind for a macro, macro food trend and something that's convenient and, and time-saving. So when you look at the attributes of sunflower oil, what are the main points that you would want to know or that consumers want to know or will help you make a choice when using this oil? We are, sunflower oil is trans fat free. It's a non-GMO product, as I had already mentioned. It has a high smoke point of 450 degrees Fahrenheit. It has excellent fry life, very stable due to only a trace element of linolenic acid resulting in a longer shelf life than other oils. Uh, we have the highest vitamin E content of all oils that are available, and this obviously relates to good heart health benefits. Uh, the neutral flavor of sunflower oil is something that is a very positive attribute of sunflower oil, and this will allow the true taste of foods to come through, and also sunflower oil blends very well with other oils and solid fats. So when you look at the profile, there are four, basically four different types of sunflower oil available, three which are readily available in the market, and the fourth is something that's a future type of oil. When you look at high linoleic, this is basically the old traditional sunflower oil. It's one that it's grown mainly throughout the world. It used to be the main oil in the U.S., but that's no longer the case. Now, the dominant two oils in the U.S. are the middle leg and the high leg varieties, and Something that's going to be around the corner into the future is the omega-9 sun oil. And this is what we would call an ultra-high oleic oil. It's something that's still somewhat in the research phase and not really commercially available. I know there's probably some samples out there, but something that that's the goal that we're moving toward is obviously getting that monounsaturated fat even higher. So I guess at this point, what I'll do is I'll turn over in the next portion of the webinar to Michelle. Yes, thanks, John. So uh, I'm going to go over some technical aspects when it comes to sunflower oil. Um, in the previous slide, uh, John showed the attributes of different varieties of sunflower oil. And, and in this slide, you're going to see the fatty acid profile of sunflower compared to other oils available uh, in the marketplace. And so when we look at this, high-lake sunflower oil, as you can see, uh, does have the highest oleic content of commercially available oils today, uh, around 86% oleic acid. And as John mentioned, sunflower oil has a very low level of low linolenic acid, so that's your C18-3. Um, and the more, when it comes to um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, the more sites of unsaturation, like linolenic acid, um, that leads to instability. So when you're talking about high heat um, stressors and applications, where stability is really key. Um, reducing that level of linolenic is, is really helpful for uh, stability. So, and that's one thing that sunflower really has going for it is its low levels of linolenic acid. In this slide too, you can also see um, compared to other oils, um, that sunflower oil, especially high like sun, is, is low in saturated fat. Uh, and then in comparison to the middle lake sun or the new sun, um, it, too, is low in linolenic acid. In, in here in the States, um, it's often compared to, say, the corn and the cottonseed oils and used fairly interchangeably with those because those also have low levels of linolenic acid. However, those have higher levels of saturate and do, do not have the same degree of oleic acid that the middle oleic sun brings to the table. When you look at fa um, the fatty acid profiles in the previous slide, you can some of that um, imparts to the stability of the oil. Uh, this slide shows 
the OSI or the Oxidative Stability Index of various oils. And then this, this is just one tool we use in the industry today um, to have a comparison between inherent stability of vegetable oils. And so here, these are all recorded as hours at 110 degrees Celsius. And so from here, you can say a uh, comparison, the high, the high lake oil, so there's omega-9 canola showed on this as well as high lake sun. High lake sun has the highest OSI time um, compared to the other oils here on this chart. Um, and then you can also see the middle lake sun, uh, as mentioned, as compared to others, um, is very comparable. Um, as I mentioned, this is only one tool for oxidative stability. Uh, and then there's, there's other attributes that will go into play when it comes to uh, oxidative stability. So um, you might see that omega-9 canola and hyaluronic sun are very, uh, fairly comparable in OSI time, but when it comes to those low levels of linolenic acid, uh, as showed before, um, a lot of times when we're talking in the marketplace, when it comes to stability, um, because of the low, the low poly and polys when it comes to sunflower oil, it still has um, some of the longest shelf life of any of the other vegetable oils out there. Over the years, um, there's been lots of research done on sunflower oil from both independent parties as well as academia and government agencies. And so today, I'm going to be showing some of the uh, information that ADM has conducted um, in, in the recent uh, couple years on sunflower oil. Uh, and then <clears throat> following that, John will discuss some more on the, on the nutritional ben benefits of sunflower oil as well. The first uh, application that I will be discussing today is frying. Um, frying is a great application for sunflower oil, both for high oleic sun as well as middle oleic sun. Uh, if, if you're familiar with the frying process, it's an ex extremely challenging process just because it's, there's high heat, there's a lot of stressors to the oil. Uh, it's fairly extreme conditions, and so um, a lot of times when we're talking about frying, we're looking at stability in the fryer, we're looking at stability in the finished food product, uh, and ways to extend those um, for greater quality uh, and cost effectiveness. As you're probably aware, um, here in the U.S., we just came off of our Thanksgiving holiday, and frying turkeys is one of the big things that we do here in the States, and so I, I also got to partake of a fried turkey this this Thanksgiving holiday, and a lot of times peanut oil is um, one of the things that are talked about when it comes to frying turkeys, but uh, sunflower oil is a fantastic frying meeting for that, too, so my, uh, my turkey this year was fried with some sunflower oil, and it was quite delicious. So the information here in this fry study, this was a lab study that was done by ADM. Um, so laboratory studies are very controlled. Um, that, so that we can see the real differences in the oils. Uh, the stressors are not necessarily the same as what you would see in institutional or restaurant frying, uh, just because there's usually a, um, a lot more that goes into those systems, whether it's the product being fried, time of temperatures, those types of things. So th these are extremely controlled settings. Uh, we just fry potatoes. Um, they're water blanched potatoes so that we don't have in, uh, impacts of other oils coming into our fryers. And we are comparing both the, the two sunflower oil options as well as compared against the high lake canola oil. So first we'll uh, take a look at the fatty acid profiles. And if you've, you've seen some of this in those previous bar charts, but um, these are the, some of the different areas that we're looking at when we're looking at fry studies, just to, for, um, in, in general, the comparisons that would impact the frying oil quality. So first is your starting quality, and that's shown at the top with your FFA, your peroxide value, OSI, et cetera. So these all had very good starting qualities, um, very typical of fresh oil. We also, these r fry studies are often done with the addition of DMPS. Um, that's antifoam or silicone, some people will know it as. So that's what's being referenced is at the dosage levels there. And then from a fatty acid profile, once again, you can see high lake sun had the highest oleic content at 85%. Um, the hyaluronic canola was in the middle at 75% oleic acid, and then uh, middle oleic sun uh, was there at 62% oleic acid. You can also see uh, the saturated fat difference uh, is slightly different across the three um, variables that were being tested. And then down at the very bottom, you can see the, the total polyunsaturates. So as we talked before, your polyunsaturates have more sites of unsaturation which can lend to instability, especially at those high heats. Uh, so while 
Um, you look at the C18-3, both the middle lake sun and the high lake sun are less than half a percent of linolenic acid, and then um, the high lake sun had the lowest degree of uh, C18-2 or linoleic acid. So this will come into play in our later results um, when we talk about the stability in the fryer. Another uh, attribute that we look at in our fry studies would be the tocopherol content. Uh, tocopherols are inherent to many vegetable oils, but they all can differ depending on the oil type as to uh, the total tocopherol content as well as what uh, the ratio is between the gamma uh, alpha and delta tocopherol. And so there was some research done by the USDA by Kathleen Warner and Jill Mosier uh, back in 2009 when there was a lot of, a lot of these um, studies that were being done on these trait enhanced oils um, <clears throat> in high oleic varieties, et cetera, uh, that looking at the tocopherol content, that a mix of tocopherol forms with gamma and delta uh, had a tendency to perform better from a protective effect from the um, heat factor. So a mix of tocopherol, but just in general having some tocopherol content there uh, is generally preferred to, to having none um, from protecting the oil. And then also, as you can see, over time tocopherol can break down and you have a decrease in tocopherol in the fryer over time and how they break down um, compared to the various oils that were being tested in this study. Another test that we look at in the frying studies is free fatty acids. In industrial frying, uh, FFA would be a very common way to look at the degradation of the oil in the fryer uh, and just overall quality. And so we look at these uh, in our controlled frying test to see where the differences lie. And you can see in this, uh, the, lower, the lower the value is preferred for FFA. So high lake sun did have a degree of difference compared to the middle lake sun as well as the high lake canola which did perform very similarly um, in this, this data set. Uh, so, and then FFA, that's reflective of uh, hydrolysis reactions, so it's measuring the impact of um, hydrolytic breakdown in the fryer, usually from inputting food, which would be where the moisture is coming from in the fryer. All these levels are pretty low for the 10 days of frying. And once again, these were um, controlled settings, so we would expect the values to be much higher and, <clears throat> well, degrees higher in a uh, restaurant frying system just where there's a lot more stress to the oil. Another attribute that is sometimes used in, say, uh, industrial frying and restaurant frying would be color to determine endpoint. And so we look at this as well in fry studies just to see if there's any big differences over the time that the oil is being used. So there's two ways to look at color. One is visually, um, which would be which more most store operators would be looking at it just to see difference. And so the bottom you can see here between the middle lake sun, high lake canola, and the high lake sun that visually there was very limit, very, very limited difference between, if any, between the day zero, day five, and day 10 um, vials. Another way we can look at it is um, hunter color difference. And so this takes into um, account all of the, the um, colors, uh, L, A, and B values compared to a white plate. And you can see, once again, this confirms that there is very limited to no difference between the three, um, three variables over the 10-day frying period. Another aspect that's important to a lot of uh, fryers would be cleanliness of the fryer over time. Um, when oil starts to break down, it'll polymerize on your, your frying equipment, and this adds some more time, stress, caustic use to get your uh, equipment in, in a clean state. So uh, a lot of times when you're looking at frying, um, frying oils, the, the amount of polyunsaturates in the oil can impact that polymerization buildup over time. And as you can see from the pictures here, the High Lake Sun had very limited um, polymerized oil. This because once again, if you remember, the it has very, very low levels of polys, but also linolenic acid, and that can be seen here. And that and that what comes into play too, I mean, especially with the conversion away from partial hydros or partially hydrogenated vegetable oils is that a lot of times if you're going to, um, say, 
a soybean oil or a canola oil, those had a, have a tendency to have more of those polyunsaturates. And the differences that can be seen there <clears throat> in the fryer is some of these polymerized buildups in the extra scrubbing and cleaning process, uh, where these high oleic options typically will not have the degree that those other oils with the high polys can be seen in the, in the fryer buildup. So from this specific study, uh, you can see that the increased oleic vegetable oils um, prove all are very good frying mediums. Um, the, over 10 days from the FFA and the color and the other attributes that we were measuring, we didn't fully break down the oil um, where the oil was considered to be non-usable anymore. Um, but all these oils would uh, help with the extended shelf life of the oil in the fryer as well as potentially increasing the, the shelf life of the, the food product coming out of the fryer. So that, that, that price study that I just showed showed um, oils used as is um, with uh, no other oils incorporated. So some of the data that we are, um, data points we're looking at too would be to look at blending oil. Um, there's a lot of reasons why uh, in industry we would blend oils. Uh, it can be for um, fun specific functionality that's needed, uh, economic uh, values that are required, flavor, nutrition, and as I mentioned, lots of different ways. So this specific blend was put together um, peanut oil, uh, great fry medium, but it has a lot of uh, sometimes costs associated with it. And so we were looking at ways to include another premium frying oil, like the Middle Lake Sun, that you could still have a very premium frying oil, but still to balance out some of the economic inputs. So the peanut oil and sunflower oil have very um, similar fatty acid profiles in the fact that they're low in linolenic acid um, and, and also balanced in the linoleic acid. And so they, they um, um, they're also both non-GMO oils. So the benefits of putting some sunflower oil into the peanut oil um, <clears throat> provided some provided those economic benefits, but also uh, had still maintained great frying and a premium frying oil. And depending on the degree of sunflower oil that was included, also had ways to decrease the saturate content compared to 100% peanut oil. So that's one way that you can take two liquid oils, blend them together to get to an endpoint to fit specific needs um, and in output. Uh, other blending that we can do is to blend for solids, and so this is a, a attribute of a all-purpose shortening that was blended with sunflower oil, and so it, um, the benefits, again, of using the sunflower oil on this is both palm and sunflower are non-GM, so this could provide a non-GMO offering for a shortening. The sunflower oil, by providing it uh, into the mix with the palm oil, palm oil reduce the saturate <clears throat> content so that um, compared to 100% palm oil. But it was also, a, it's a very stable shortening because of its high in monounsaturates and very low, less than 1% linolenic acid once again. So um, the stability is still there for this um, blend. So a lot of times when we're talking about sunflower oil, uh, we talk about the stability of sunflower oil, both millic and hyaluronic sunflower. And so, um, depending on the application, though, you might need increased stability for shelf life, depending on the packaging being used, the substrate that it's being used on, et cetera. So, <coughs> excuse me, in this day and age, there's more emphasis, as John was talking about, on clean label and ways to get there. And so, what this is showing is the impact of antioxidants on middle layer sunflower oil. So once again, this is OSI data, so that oxidative stability index, and it shows the, the results are at um, hours at 110C. So your sunflower oil with no ads had around a 10-hour OSI time. When uh, an additional uh, dosage of mixed tocopherols is added, then you can increase um, the degree of increase is dependent on the amount added, but in this there was 400 parts per million of tocopherols added with a three-hour increase in OSI time. Another natural antioxidant being used on the market in the marketplace today is rosemary, 
And so, and this was a thousand more parts per million of a synergistic rosemary ascorbic blend. They were the doubling of OSI time. And a lot of times still in industry today, um, we have a tendency to still compare against TBHQ, which is a synthetic antioxidant, but very commonly used. But with clean labels, um, there's some movement away from TBHQ um, so that, there, once again, you're not using synthetic uh, antioxidants and that you do not have to put uh, a TBHQ on the label. So um, both can have, both the tocopherols and the rosemary can have increased OSI times um, compared to the middle lake sunflower oil without any additives. Uh, another pathway that we're seeing in the marketplace today, too, would be if, if you don't want to add, label any antioxidant, would be to maybe instead of using middle lake sunflower oil, would be to use high lake sunflower oil in its place. Because um, if you can remember, uh, the OSI time there can be um, around 18 to 20 hours for that. So uh, that, that's a different pathway where you could only label one product instead of having to do an oil and an antioxidant system. So different pathways, but definitely that trend towards um, uh, cleaner labels uh, and more natural products, with sun, which sunflower lends itself to. And now we'll talk some about the applications um, that sunflower oil can fit into. And as you can see from this slide, there, I mean, sunflower fits into a host of applications, um, frying that we've gone over quite a bit, but um, really sunflower oil uh, lends itself um, to frying just from the stability standpoint, both in the fryer as well as in the finished product, uh, which and especially in snack food items and um, those bagged shelf-stable items where that's really um, critical to help maintain stability uh, on, on the store shelf. Um, the other oil, uh, we see a lot of sunflower used as spray oils. So spray oils are used um, whether for seasoning adhesions on the snacks, items, um, nuts and seeds. Uh, you know, spray oils used in the crackers um, too. And so when you think of a spray oil, you have a lot of uh, oxygen surface interface. And so you need a lot of that oxidative stability when it comes to spray oil to maintain oxidative stability and prevent those rancid flavors over time. And so um, both middle lake sun and high lake sun have a, um, a lot of functionality when it comes to spray oils across the board. Uh, and once again, a lot of these things like nuts and seeds, granola, a lot of times those are having very specific package claims that sunflower oil lends itself to. In the bakery segment, um, sunflower oil can be used in a, different, a lot of different formats. So um, certain bakery applications you can get by with a liquid oil, which sunflower is, um, so you can get that neutral profile um, with those package claims, but you can um, also, as we talked about, blend with some palm oil if you need some solids for various applications and still have a functional all-purpose type shortening um, while maintaining stability and getting nutritional, application, uh, nutritional um, attributes from the sunflower. When we talk about margarines and spreads, these are typically you're going to combine whether um, with a palm oil or a fully hydrogenated oil or applying inner esterification to get a very functional solid. But sunflower oil can be used in these types of applications. Once again, if you're targeting a non-GMO claim with palm or you need specific functionality or nutrition, um, sunflower oil has a great fit in this, these types of applications as well. In the sauce and dip category, you'll see sunflower oil used um, hummus, um, a lot of times hummus has that non-GMO claim, which sunflower oil lends itself to very well. Um, cheese sauces, the, the flavor profile of sunflower oil in cheese sauces lends itself really nicely. Um, the salad dressings and tomato sauces, um, a great scent once again for sunflower oil. Uh, a lot of, I mean, all of these are being used um, in, uh, typically in a liquid format. Um, in, in some instances, you need uh, some additional stability that sunflower oil can provide. And then prepared foods. Um, prepared foods is a huge category um, with a ton of different applications, but sunflower oil um, can lend itself to these as well. Whether you're doing maybe a spray-dried product like a powdered gravy or a soup mix or <clears throat> shelf-stable that you need that shelf stability for a, a, a long period of time. Um, that uh, you need your oil to maintain quality. Um, 
something like a high lake sun or a new or middle lake sun can work really, really well in those types of applications just because of that shelf shelf life that is required or are typically applied to those types of products. Um, or even in, say, frozen vegetables or those types of things, if you're making a soft application, um, soft, uh, sunflower oil can work really well in that as well. So as you can see from this slide, there truly is a whole host of applications that sunflower oil fits really nicely into, uh, and I would encourage you to um, put it as one of the, the screening options uh, to see how it fits into your application and ways you can apply uh, and, and, and run through the list of the different checks that it marks as far as the nutritional attributes, the labeling attributes, um, and the functionality attributes that it would really bring to the table for your application. So, and from that, I'll conclude the functionality um, discussion and pass it back to John for nutritional. Um, once again, if there's questions for me at the end, um, as Chris mentioned, just go ahead and type them in, and we can get to those here in a minute. Okay, thank you, Michelle, for that in-depth analysis of sunflower oil and its attributes and how it works well with different types of products. Um, just want to talk to you a little bit about the health benefits of sun oil. And one of the biggest things that sunflower oil can do, and I know a lot of consumers out there are looking at this, is how do you boost that HDL level in your cholesterol? And that's obviously the good cholesterol that everybody wants to increase, and you want to lower that LDL cholesterol. And just, you know, sunflower, like I said, is before is, is non-GMO, we're trans fat free, and we are low in saturated fat. It's naturally high in vitamin E, monounsaturates, and it obviously provides some really good heart healthy benefits. And some of you may be aware of this study. Uh, it was a recent study done at the U of T by Dr. David Jenkins. Um, he, it, he was in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, and it showed that the intake of monounsaturated fats, particularly those found in sunflower oil, can boost HDL, the good cholesterol. Uh, what happened in the study was that the participants replaced bread and sugar with one tablespoon of hyaluronic sunflower oil at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And after four weeks, those HDL levels of good cholesterol increased by 12.5%. And that's obviously a very good level, and who wouldn't want to have you know that, that great of an uh, advancement? Um, also, we have conducted a study, or NSA conducted a study, with Dr. Penny Chris Atherton at Penn State University. And in that study, the participants used two tablespoons of middle leg sun oil or olive oil to replace saturated fat to see how it affected their cholesterol levels. And the results of the study were very interesting in that, you know, most, most people think that olive oil is the healthiest oil and has the greatest effect on lowering cholesterol. But what Dr. Etherton, Chris Etherton found was uh, that the olive oil diet, there was no significant lowering of cholesterol. In the middle leg sun oil diet that people were consuming, their total cholesterol was decreased by 4.7% and lowered their LDL cholesterol by 5.8%. And what in the study, what she attributed this to was the balance of the fatty acids in new sun that provides this benefit. We have a higher uh, PUFA level than the olive oil. So when we talk about the future of sunflower oil, where is the U.S. industry going in the Canadian acres that are grown? Um, currently, about 75 to 80 percent of the sun oil crop is middle lake sunflower, and this this is changing. Um, over the next few years, we're shifting the crop here in the United States and, and in Canada to some degree to a, more of a higher lake sunflower oil that will be grown. Uh, reasons for doing this: obviously, it offers greater fire life stability and longer shelf life for food manufacturers, and it has that very high monounsaturated level. Um, the new sunflower oil that's very high in oleic acids and has a lower saturation, 3%, this is the omega-9 oil, is being developed. And it's something that it's still in the research development stage. It's, it's obviously a direction that we want to go to in the future. Um, and this is going to be a naturally stable oil that will not require antioxidants or TBHQ. Uh, this could be very helpful in supporting that all-natural packaging claims. Um, just also want to let you know that there continues to be a consistent supply of sun oil, and the farmers here are willing to expand acres to meet that increasing demand for the oil. Um, and I guess at this point, I would turn it back over to Chris, and we, we could take your questions. So just a reminder, if anyone has any questions, uh, down on the uh, lower left corner, uh, you can just type in, uh, your question, and we'll uh, direct it to uh, Michelle and John. So um, 
We have a question here. Uh, I think, Michelle, this would be a good question for you to answer. Uh, I'm currently using soybean oil in packaged brownies. If I switch to sun oil, could I extend the product shelf life of the brownies? Yeah, in most likelihood, you would be able to. Um, soybean oil has uh, one of the higher degrees of polyunsaturates. So if you're today uh, in your brownie mix, if at the end of shelf life, if you're getting some of those off notes from rancidity, specifically oil rancidity, um, I think a more stable oil would be something definitely to look at to help um, increase that shelf life. And I think sunflower oil could lend itself to that, yes. Great. Um, here's another question that I think uh, we're going to need your help with, Michelle. Uh, do we need to put allergen warnings on the label if we used sunflower oil combined with peanut oil? And I don't know whether you... Yeah, Yeah, there's some different perspectives in the industry today. Um, all highly refined vegetable oils are free from allergens just because of the uh, deodorization process, denatures all of the proteins. Um, and most of the oil industry will can provide letters to their customers regarding that. Mm -hmm. I would say that um, some some of our customers may customers may lean lean to the side of caution on that at times, just because some consumers get overly cautious when they see peanuts anywhere on the label. Um, but highly refined vegetable oils, um, and there are letters out there uh, regarding that. Great. And uh, we have another question. Why would omega-9 be a better performer versus uh, an omega-3 oil when frying? So maybe you can just go over that again, Michelle, because I know you touched on that. Yep, so omega-9 omega reflects oleic acid, so that's a monounsaturated fatty acid where your omega-3s are your linolenic acid. So um, nutritional, a lot of times the omega content refers maybe more of a nutritional lexicon where <clears throat> we talk in the, the fatty acid components, so C18, 3, 2, and 1, or um, oleic, uh, linolenic, linoleic, and linolenic. So it, it, they're kind of backwards when I, I like to think of them. But so when you're talking omega-3, you have more, that's your higher polyunsaturates, so your C18-3. And nutritionally, um, those are those are good inputs. However, from a heat stability standpoint and oxidative stability standpoint, those are the first to break down. So there's more sites of unsaturation where oxygen can attack on those bonds. And therefore, uh, in a frying standpoint, those, uh, those sites of unsaturation are more prone to hydrolysis, to polymerization, and all these reactions that happen in the fryer. So when you're looking at oils, your omega-9s, um, because they're predominantly monounsaturated fatty acids, are more heat stable and more oxidatively stable, and therefore can give you a prolonged fry life compared to your omega-3s. And uh, Michelle, just one other comment. There would be more omega-3 in regular canola oil, correct? Yes, regular canola, regular soy, those are very high in uh, omega omega-3s, yes. Great. Okay. And um, we have another uh, question here about um, uh, cold pressed um, cold pressed sunflower oil. Uh, versus chemical extraction of um, oil in sunflowers. And I know, like, again, the process of this, there's not as much cold press oil out there. But I don't know, John or Michelle, can you comment on the chemical extraction of oil in sunflowers, food safety, all of that? I don't know which yeah, one of you would be better. Yeah. It has to go to the positioning of your product in the marketplace more than not, I would say. Right. Um, when, you, when you're looking at your um, expeller pressed or cold pressed oil compared to <clears throat> traditional extraction methods, um, is, is it usually goes if you have a front of package claim or you're making a claim associated with that. Um, chemical extraction um, is more efficient typically uh, in, in why it's used uh, and also with that, 
Um, the the solvents used in extraction are for almost 100% removed from that oil, so that there aren't any residual, not necessarily the residuals there that some people might associate. And so um, I would say it's more of a marketing standpoint why you would use one over the other. Functionally, though, um, some, sometimes there's some feedback that you can see some functional differences between it just because of um, maybe some they're less processed, the expeller press ones. Um, but once again, that could lend itself to maybe the product that it's going into. Great. Uh, one final question, maybe, I think we have here. Um, uh, Michelle, you mentioned that uh, about the blending of um, sunflower oil and solid fats. Would you be able to do a blend of um, a solid fat with sunflower oil for the creation of, like, crackers or biscuits? Do you think that that might work as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, those types, I mean, uh, when typically those types of applications, you still need some solids for functionality. So whether right. there's various sources that you can get those solids from, depending on, once again, what you would like on your label, what nutritional attributes you would like. Um, but a lot, blending for solids is definitely being employed. Um, and so I think the, the functionality could definitely be achieved for those applications. Great. Any more questions? Um, yes. Uh, someone asked if they'd be able to get a copy of this presentation. We will send out uh, the presentation, and as I mentioned, it will be posted on the uh, NSA website uh, for future uh, listening. Uh, I guess at this point we'll wrap it up. I just want to thank John and Michelle uh, for uh, sharing the information uh, with the webinar participants. I hope that everyone uh, has a clear understanding of the benefits of non-GMO uh, sunflower oil, and I hope that you'll consider using it when you're reformulating or creating new products. Thank you, everyone, for participating. And if you have any additional questions, um, my email address is just here on the last slide. So if you think of anything um, after, after the webinar that comes to mind, please send me an email and I'll uh, send it off to Michelle or John and uh, get them to help with, your, uh, with the answer. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you, John and Michelle. Have a great afternoon.